the European Union right now is having this kind of, I would say, ambiguous, mm. um, comfortable line of action and policy towards China. And in the case of a military attack on uh, Taiwan, the whole region are going to be blocked. That would mean that you know, people will go on the streets. It is true that in Europe in general, you know, Asia has been very, very far away. Hmm. You know, to the point we have been so much mixed up with our own internal issues that even our neighborhood, even in North Africa, which is very close to us, we are not really following very well what is happening. The European Union is very, it's, it's a very strange animal, uh, at least for the outside world. It's difficult, it's uh, complex, the decision-making process, the division of labor between institutions, the competences between states and, uh, and Brussels, it's, it's difficult. We, the two uh, actors, the one uh, is the biggest democratic democracy bloc, the other is the oldest democracy, we can actually merge forces, not necessarily to launch a new non-alignment movement, but to go a third way that create credible counterweight to binary choices. Massive division in, in Europe between the countries who, are, uh, who feel that they're directly exposed to, the, to Russia. Perceptions sometimes are uh, more important than everything else in international relations, but we should not be led by perceptions only. This crisis of, uh, around the Ukraine, of the war with, in Ukraine, it's a, it's a very serious one, and we need to talk to each other. Namaste Jehind, welcome to another edition of ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. This is being recorded at the Rai Sina Dialogue held in March 2023 in New Delhi. Today's topic for discussion is on the European Union, its interests in the Asian region. How has the Ukrainian conflict impacted on its foreign policy? Does it have any interest in the Indo-Pacific region? The dynamics with China has closer European integration come to an end and will we begin to see power return to national capitals? The speakers today, Mr. Rui Vinhas, Director General of Foreign Policy Portugal. Rui's held positions dealing with multilateral affairs such as UN and NATO. He was the permanent representative to the Political and Security Committee of the EU in Brussels. Besides an illustrious diplomatic career, he's also authored several articles on international relations and has been published in academic journals. Velina Chekorova, founder for a conscious experience FACE Austria. Velina conducts strategic foresight and trend analysis for the Austrian Ministry of Defense and is an instructor at the Real World Risk Institute. Tommy Hotanen, Executive Director, the Wilfred Martins Center for European Studies, Finland. Hutanen's work focuses mainly on economic and social policy. He's been political advisor for the EPP and has authored many articles. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Velina, for joining me in this podcast. Um, I'll begin with Rui. Uh, what has, why has foreign policy in the European Union been one of the least integrated elements um, foreign policies of individual states, they're often competing and contrasting with each other in the European Union. Well, uh, well, thank you for the invitation, thank you for having me. Uh, basically, I mean, uh, it's, 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 very, it's very simple. I mean, uh, it's the core policy of a sovereign state. I mean, it's uh, defense and foreign policy are, are two of the the main uh, policies of a, of a, in the in the quite the core of the, of a sovereign state. So uh, the, the the treaties uh, not yet as uh, uh, organized those policies as common policies of the European Union, but still as uh, policies in which we need a consensus, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, which uh, and the, the big uh, the, the major strengths of those policies, the foreign policy and defense is pre is precisely consensus in, in my view. Uh, because uh, the power of, uh, of the European Union is unity and to speak uh, uh, on behalf of the 27, I mean. And, uh, but I think that uh, we have our problems and the, the decision-making process is sometimes difficult, the negotiation is hard, but as you can see now in, a, in a, probably the major crisis uh, in Europe since, uh, since, uh, since the, its foundation, at least in, in security terms, uh, uh, the European Union has been quite uh, united in, in, in very difficult and tough decisions like sanctions, like uh, 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 supporting the military effort of the Ukrainians. So uh, 
so it's it's possible, and uh, we can work on this basis and uh, very su successfully. By the way, in, in this crisis, I, 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 it's according to my experience, mm -hmm. it has been a, a very good example. That, uh, uh, but a discussion on uh, going to uh, qualified majority instead of consensus is is there. Uh, but we're still far from uh, from a decision uh, that will go through uh, revision but of the sitting, treaties. Uh, sitting in Asia, we don't see that kind of sync uh, synchronization as far as views are concerned uh, in the EU uh, on sanctions and China. I will get to that. But uh, Tommy has a closer European integration. Uh, is it? as good as uh, he's saying, or do you think that it's ending and power is returning back to the national capitals? So mm, uh, our session, our session today is, uh, is discussing about what binds Europe. And, and I think it's interesting when we start to reflect on that, it's a little bit go back and, and, and to ask what, what did originally by, did bind European Union what, what is binding today. So originally, as we know, it was a result of the uh, First and Second World War. The Europeans had uh, killed uh, uh, each other tens of millions and considered that this needs to change. And so the peace was the driving force in the European Union. Uh, then decades passed and, and there was maybe, you know, peace what became the new normality and, and there was a search for new narrative. And that narrative was prosperity. So a purpose... Uh, peace, prosperity, second uh, P, uh, and uh, and uh, Europe was focusing on that, on on trade, no trade barriers, uh, single market, uh, creation of the euro. But then 2007 and 2008, they were econ in an economic crisis. Again, this question they, they came. So what keeps the European Union to, together? And now, uh, and, and then we had also Brexit. So United Kingdom, which India knows very well, went went away but now currently we have found i could say the third b uh, problem solving in global scale we have the climate change uh, which obviously the europeans understand that we need, we, we cannot do it with 27 of us uh, separately we have war in ukraine the energy crisis all of all of that so that is now the new kind of i would say the new new re uh, reason to be together uh, also with the war in Ukraine, there's a lot of negati negative and sad aspects of that. But really, I think in that Europe is really has found a new, 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 new uh, determination and maybe also unity on 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 this issue. And currently, they are, they are development now really for the first while, uh, time to create common, for example, military industry and really uh, uh, serious discussion for the very first time. Right. Um, you spoke about the Ukrainian conflict and Rui also mentions it. Um, you know, um, though this podcast is on Europe, but you're seeing uh, on the sidelines, you're seeing that the US, its allies, countries of the South, uh, they're engaged in this war of words when it comes to G20 and uh, the meet, especially with regard to the Ukrainian conflict. Even on sanctions, though Rui says that there is a unity, even on that between Eastern European bloc and the Western European nations, isn't there any kind of a conflict or rethink or um, difference of opinion? Well, the, I would say there's a kind of two levels. First of all, if you look at the public opinions, uh, uh, you know, obviously, in the, so there's a massive division in, in Europe between the countries who, are, uh, who feel that they're directly exposed to, the, to Russia, to the risk. So it's an existential question. So the, the discussion in public sphere is very different. Then you have those countries which uh, do not have with some variation. And uh, for example, in, uh, in uh, Finland, Nordic countries, Baltic uh, countries, there's, it's very clear they are in favor of, uh, favor of sanctions and all of that. Uh, then when you go south, Italy, Greece, which have historic reasons, it gets a little bit more nuanced. But, pub, but in the public opinion, and by the way, Portugal and, and uh, Spain, they uh, are very, there's a very, also among public, there's a very strong support for the sanctions and EU uh, 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 action. So there's a, it's a more, um, uh, there's a more different layers in a public opinion. But in uh, in the uh, head of state level the unity at least at the moment is is very clear and uh, we can ask why maybe because the moral case for ukraine is so so strong also with uh, what russia has been doing in the front you know terrible things i don't start to ma make a list here it, it's created the situations for the for the that for the leaders to say something 
you know, let's try to find a way, let's try to uh, discuss. It's, it's a very, very clear. And, and uh, as, you know, just recently, yesterday, Italian Prime Minister was here from these countries, from these countries where, where there's a very many opinions about Russia. And her message was very, very clear on that. Yes. And presenting like uh, if you would go to North or Baltic to Estonia, you couldn't, you couldn't have different line. So Europe is very united on that. On this, claim. okay. So, Valina, I'm going to come to you now that I'm done with the talking to the, the men. <laughs> yes, and now I don't need to talk to them after <laughs> this. You do now, no? <laughs> now it's just between the two of you us. You can leave, I can <laughs> take over. Okay, I yeah. take over from No, no, office. we need them to listen to us, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, you know, you recently tweeted uh, that the US is quite aware that though China may say otherwise, but the State Department believes that Beijing has clearly taken a side in the Ukrainian conflict. Now, what is the view in Europe? Um, are they conflicted or is there a consensus that China is uh, no longer, or China and Russia have colluded? Well, this is a very interesting question. And here, uh, once again, we see, depending on where exactly in Europe you're going to look for answers, uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, diversification of opinions, which is very normal for let's say democratic societies, uh, uh, you know, pluralistic societies, people try to figure out things together. Mm -hmm. uh, governments, in our case also European institutions, because they have a very significant role to play when it comes specifically to the relationship with the big powers, with the United States, with China, mm -hmm. and so on. European institutions also have a saying. And then of course citizens. And here, uh, the question on China, right, uh, is uh, going to be an ambiguous one in my personal view. Why? Because first, uh, obviously, uh, the European Union as a collective actor wants to play a significant role in a world that is based on certain rules, uh, uh, mostly, of course, in the field of trade, in the field of uh, economic ties, uh, in all the relevant areas. And uh, for that matter, the European Union and specifically the big European powers uh, were convinced, probably this is going to shift a little bit now, depending on exactly that kind of okay. case uh, that you uh, shortly quoted. Um, th they were convinced that they need China for that, that they need, of course, uh, let's say, solid and stable business relations with uh, China. Mm -hmm. And uh, the previous uh, German government um, under Mer Merkel even managed to you know, facilitate the relationship to the point, uh, together of course with the uh, institutions, with Brussels, but also with the French uh, uh, counterpart, to even propose a, a comprehensive partnership on investment. Now, let me uh, also highlight that, for instance, right now the so-called FTA you know, FTA with India that is being renegotiated mm. is higher in the hierarchy of uh, treaties of the European Commission than a partnership on investment. And yet, this partnership on investment would have set a framework for all member states, for all 27 members, to practically, you know, uh, have a trade relationship uh, with uh, China in a settled manner. Of course, uh, the, the, the partnership did not stand any chance and was put on hold a month later when the European Parliament, which is the institution that uh, practically um, well reflects the, uh, the choice of uh, the citizens, of the European citizens, so you have you know, a parliament of 702 uh, you know, um, representatives. Uh, they put it on hold, you know, based on human rights violations and labor rights violations, so on and so forth. And this created, you know, coupled, of course, with the mood from the pandemic, where many European states noted that you know, China was using certain tools to create a positive image, and so on and so forth, created a new kind of, uh, let's say, mood within Europe. And specifically then, what happened was, uh, you know, in uh, the Baltic states with Lithuania, which also uh, kind of shifted uh, towards, uh, you know, on the one hand, improving the relationship with Taiwan by launching an official representation, uh, so an official diplomatic repre uh, representation of Taiwan. It uh, immediately deteriorated the relationship with China. China obviously also uh, was putting uh, representatives from the parliament and from think tanks on sanctions list following this, you know, uh, situation with the uh, failed treaty. So we suddenly 
had a new situation. And that was mm. prior, you know, to the war. And then, of course, with the war, I mean, I'm probably one of the, let's say, few European analysts, um, and I'm certainly, I've been certainly in the minority, who has been pointing to uh, modus vivendi of coordination between China and Russia in various uh, domains, uh, not yes. specifically the defense one, the so-called Dragon Bear. For the last 10 years, following the first invasion, this has never been an issue for discussion mm. in Europe, in the European capitals, maybe in certain closed circles you know, of defense, as, uh, security uh, pundits, but certainly was not an issue at all. And then with the war, when the war began, and we actually when European officials... So, what I was anticipating that practically China will be disseminating the same Russian narratives. Think of, you know, the narrative. It was a NATO expansion, uh, then the sanctions policy. You know, we saw all of these important narratives being actually disseminated. This was a kind of, I would say, an eye-opener. Uh, for the European capitals, for the European uh, member states, but also for the European institutions. And now we are in a kind of a limbo because contrary to United States, which is, I would argue, already in an overt competition hmm. and is taking measures in all of these you know, relevant uh, areas um, and fields, the European Union is in a, in a much more difficult situation. It's still hesitating Though, to say it. Forget about taking action, right? It is, we are still struggling, let's struggling. say. And I um, mm. am convinced that it actually, we sh should actually be more open with the, uh, specifically towards the risks that may emerge if we are not addressing the issue. Mm. Because uh, that kind of... Um, Solidarity that my colleagues were, you know, uh, correctly pointing to may be endangered in the case of China because I think that a certain group of European member states would probably go along with the United States, not so much based on only on personal conviction, conviction uh, you know, when it comes to the approach to China, but also because they see that the United States is the only guarant of their security and their territorial integrity mm. in the future following the the, 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 the the you know the Russian war against Ukraine and in doing so there will be another block of course which is more constructive which will try to navigate which doesn't want to get caught in a binary world you know it wants to still somehow keep the equilibrium that is right now in global affairs. And this may create a kind of bifurcation within Europe, which I'm really, really uh, practically afraid of. Uh, and I think that by addressing the issues, by speaking about it, and it will be a necessity at some point of time, um, and the moment for me, the red line, will be certainly if China decides to deliver exactly. military assistance. Uh, because okay. if China decides to deliver military assistance to Russia, That's the we line. will yeah. end with a proxy war, a proxy war between Russia and Ukraine, where two new system rivals are practically helping the both sides, and where Russia will lose its global power status. Okay. Uh, that, will be my, that will be my call. So, <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Vinas, uh, I think uh, very eloquently put out here that there, you know, the veil has been lifted about, uh, uh, and there's no ambiguity now about uh, China alluding, uh, colluding with uh, Russia. Um, can there be any ambiguity now in all of the EU states? Uh, and, you know, because there was ambiguity when it came to uh, the India-China conflict, when it happened in Galwan on mm -hmm. our borders. EU was kind of mm, was tiptoeing around the issue. Was did not come out openly and castigate China or say that this was expansionist policy of China. Now is it going to be tiptoeing as or coming straight out and or does that have to be an attack or does it have to be military transfers? What needs to be done now for EU to decide? Okay, we're going to take action or we're going to say something. Well, I mean. Um uh, that is a, that is a complex um, uh, issue. Um, I mean, first, uh, I agree uh, uh, in uh, in generally with with what was said. But China, I mean, we 
international relations are uh, dynamic and fluid. If we go back uh, two years, the, the transatlantic relation between the European Union and the US was not so good as it is now. Uh, if we go back uh, some more years, uh, uh, the relations between the European Union and India were not as in such a good uh, phase as, as they are now. Uh, actually, uh, it was during the Portuguese presidency of the European Union that we were able to break through and, uh, and relaunch an economic agenda with, uh, between the European Union and India in 2021. Uh, so, this is to say that uh, international relations are fluid and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the dynamics with, with China go uh, between ups and downs. Now we are not in a hub, but uh, I will not qualify it as uh, something uh, final. Okay. Although uh, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian war can be a qualitative element in this equation. I mean, mm -hmm. if if uh, if if uh, some steps are taken by China, that can uh, represent uh, an issue for the European uh, member states. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, right. But I will not uh, anticipate. Uh, uh, not in let the me just, if, if I may, in sure. thirty seconds. I mean, e e e and picking in what Tommy was saying before, and uh, in in your two first questions. I mean about the European Union. The European Union is very, it's, it's a very strange animal, uh, mm -hmm. at least for the outside world. I mean, even for us uh, in, in working, uh, members of the European Union are working, it's, it's, it's difficult, it's uh, complex, the decision-making process, the division of labor between institutions, the competences between states and, uh, and Brussels, it's, it's difficult. Uh, it's a unique project, it's, it's, it's very beautiful, but uh, unfinished, uh, ever unfinished, it's like the, the cathedral in Barcelona, the, the, the Guaido, of course, it never is, it's never finished. But, uh, but the fact is that crisis after crisis, and the 21st century has been a, 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 a century of crisis for the European Union, the financial crisis that Tommy mentioned, even we have to invent another word because crises are by definition transitional and we are mm. give, uh, living in crisis. Then the, the, the migration crisis, then the Brexit after yeah. six enlargements, it was the first time that uh, a member state of the European Union decided to leave the Union. And then the pandemic and now a war. And in, in, in each and every of these crises, the European Union had come out uh, stronger and united and with more elements of integration. Uh, for instance, the answer to the pandemic was uh, extraordinary. I mean, uh, we develop uh, competences in health, public health, that we didn't have before. Uh, buying uh, vaccines and uh, coordinating the answers to, uh, with, you know, across Europe or uh, or um, so it w or uh, going to the market and uh, borrowing money uh, the so called euro bonds uh, in on behalf of the the 27 so this these were step major steps yes uh, in the middle of a, a huge crisis and again now in ukraine as we as we are as we were mentioning, these are the two issues the, the, I think of divergence. We, we have Ukraine been united and China. with doing Russia. things that we have and never yeah. that we have never done before. For instance, to supply military equipment to Ukraine. Yes, because it's, it's hard. Uh, you know, um, Tommy, I'm going to come to you. Um, the Indian External Affairs Minister last year, and I quote: He said, uh, "Somewhere Europe has to grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems, but the world's problems are not Europe's problems." And the German Chancellor repeated the statement at the Munich Security Conference. Um, he said that the Indian Foreign Minister had a point. Uh, this is the way Asia sees Europe. Let me tell you, it's not just India. Um, South Asia sees Europe like that. Uh, do you agree? Disagree? Uh. Yeah, it was very, very, you know, uh, clear statement. And very viral. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very viral. Also, it came very interesting moment because that was exactly the moment when the whole, uh, you know, the, uh, in the context of whole UN votings and, you know, how India would, the, the, you know, there was focus on India and then came that, that, um, that, uh, that statement. It's, you know, to keep it open it up. So, of course, it's question is, okay, what do you mean exactly? Of course, uh, you know, we, I know that, it, uh, or we know that it was mentioned in the context of Ukraine war, but you, if you say that Europe doesn't care about world's problems, you know, uh, there's still the 
you know, Europe is, is giving 75 billion euros, which is what 9,000 billion rupees every year to the, in the world development aid in the old corners. The EU is presented in all the, uh, all the, all the countries and tries to be involved. So in that sense, that sense, uh, that soft element is is there. But if you then say that, that, that it was meant in in a way that in a context that you know, okay, we had this problem. We had this problem in China, in Himalaya. They are you know Indian Ocean. Uh, you know all these questions, and 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 you, you never said nothing. And now we, you know you have that thing, and you come to us to uh, ask sympathy. And, uh, and okay, well, there one point, we Europeans, because of our history, are quite bad on managing military conflict. You know, Yugoslavia war, it's basically, I can say as a think tanker, it was United States who came to uh, clean the mess. Ukraine also, the situation would not be so uh, good if the United States would not be there uh, with, uh, with the military assistance and, uh, and you know, uh, kind of the leadership, because we don't, uh, you know, the, the the kind of mindset is not there and, and not, not the uh, you know, capacity. But I think the, the good news, and there maybe I can be a little bit more sharper, it's that I think that's uh, the point, you know, maybe what was referred in the Munich conference is that, that it is true that in Europe in general, you know, Asia has been very, very far away. Hmm. You know, to the point we have been so much, much uh, mixed up with our own internal issues that even our neighborhood, even in North Africa, which is very close to us, we are not really following very well what is happening, mm. let alone Asia. But now that I think it has, has changed for the normal people and business CEOs for the reason that now we understand in Europe that what happens in Asia has an impact in Europe next day. So if, if China, because now, because of this, at the Russia's aggression to Ukraine, also the question, well, will China make the same move with, me, with Taiwan? So if it does, you know, Europeans understand, okay, we have invested massive to, to China and the whole you know, factories and companies. So if the attack comes, most likely we will go, have to go to some mm. kind of sanctions as a reciprocity. And then we are in, in, in a trouble. And then the focus is on India, exactly, maybe also where the Indian stands, but not only the new possibilities. And maybe that's the silver lining. And maybe, uh, maybe for example, that can be one of part of our agenda, publicly or not publicly, is to, how to tackle with the China, how to do it, because we have a common interest, common, uh, uh, you know, uh, concerns. And, uh, and the last, uh, I, I personally think that we, have, we are, I think Europe, okay, we are many countries, 20 now, 27, and we have different views, but in these issues, I think we have started to pick a side. If we want to be, as all in Europe, if we say, we want to be a global power, but then you have to show leadership. Leadership means choices. You have to make choice. You have to pick your choice. I would, I would pick the choice of India. Okay. Yeah, that, that. Uh, concluding remarks, Velina, we were talking about uh, China. How much does Europe really want to get involved? Because as uh, Tommy was pointing out, that uh, it wasn't part of you know a sphere that uh, Europe was interested in or showed any kind of inclination to be interested in. But now you know everybody is interconnected. So now when we talk about EU geographical borders, cultural borders, where does it stop? And if, like you said, if the China-Taiwan uh, conflict or in the South China Sea, if it gets aggressive, then um, does Europe get involved? Will Europe get involved? Will it, will it become a bigger issue than it is now? Are you trying to diplomatically <laughs> ask me whether Europe would get militarily involved, involved on yes. behalf of the United States <laughs> if uh, China decides yeah. to launch a military attack because on Because it's a question in, uh, which is being discussed even in Australia, right? So uh, I would like to know what it is about Europe, like uh, why the hesitation? Well, you see, this is exactly the point uh, which I was trying to make, that this kind of big risk I see emerging on the horizon. I'm not saying it has to happen like that. Uh, and I absolutely agree that international relations are fluid. Things are happening all the time. We have plenty of game changers. And yet there are some kind of objective trends. And one of the things is that uh, it is about credibility. And mm. in that sense, uh, first, I have to say that I am personally am not convinced that China uh, is having the intention of launching a military attack on Taiwan in the short term. 
Now, not only based on what uh, Beijing was uh, seeing happening in uh, the war, in Russian war against uh, Ukraine, but in general, think of uh, the uh, internal, uh, you know, the internal stability paradigm that China is always pursuing. You know, everything is centered around the topic of having a predictable in domestic uh, process. Mm. Uh, and in the case of a military attack on uh, Taiwan, the whole region with the relevant global choke points that are providing the critical supply for the China, uh, for the Chinese population, are going to be blocked, in not only in a week, uh, but in months maybe, and so on. So Trade that, routes and everything. That would, mean, yeah. that would mean that, you know, people will go on the streets uh, because of, you know, uh, the lack of uh, critical supply. But anyway, going back to your main question, and that is, in case of military attack by China on Taiwan, I am not convinced that there will be a coherent approach by Europe. Mm. That means European institutions and all the 27 member states um, when it comes to the response. I'm also not even convinced that we will be able to, let's say, launch these comprehensive sanctions the way how we did that uh, Russia, on Russia. Okay. That is my point. Uh, and yes, the European Union right now is having this kind of, I would say, ambiguous, mm. um, comfortable line of action and policy towards China. You know, framing China of, you know, of a partner on certain issues. It was mentioned climate change, health issues and so on. Then we have a competitor part that is on economic issues, and then we have the system rival part. And I'm asking myself, if you are framing someone as a system rival, uh, what are you really actually considering? Action as points. Plan, as, an, yeah. as an action plan, in right. case that things really deteriorate. So we, will, we may observe a final sentence on my side, members that will be very, very, let's say, loyal mm -hmm. with the American position, on that matter for the sake of their partnership with the United States, mm. first and foremost. And then we will have, you know, more, like I said, more constructive line of policy that will try to, you know, somehow mitigate the risks emerging out of this situation. And we may see uh, sanctions, but not in this scope, not in this, certainly not in this scope. Okay. Yes, and maybe, maybe just, uh, you know, a final remark which considers India. I think that right now, with this bifurcation of the global system, with the deepening decoupling between United States and China, with Russia's war against Ukraine, which I argue that uh, is also about the future of the global order. It's not just about Ukraine. It's not only about the security order in Europe, but it's also about the positioning of Russia in this newly emerging systemic conflict. I think there may be a big chance for India and uh, the European Union to find a kind of new modus vivendi for a third way to not get caught in this, you know, Cold War 2.0 mentality and to, you know, get caught in a binary ch choices okay. world. But to say we, the two uh, actors, the one uh, is the biggest democratic democracy block, the other is the oldest democracy, we can actually merge forces, not necessarily to launch a new non-alignment movement, but to go a third way that create credible counterweight to binary choices and say we don't need a Cold War 2.0 in this critical period of uh, the international relations. Okay. Tell me you disagree? Uh, yeah, well, okay, that's the third way. That way, I'm not so sure if uh, it's um, how how it will find out. But I wanted I wanted to comment on on this China first. First, first of all, two points. Uh, f most most likely, okay, we don't know, but most likely China. If China really wants to go after Taiwan, there's a various phases. I think most likely, because you cannot just launch an attack. You know, the, mm. it's not like I take my car in the front of the house and I just go. It will be visible for months and months and months because it's a massive logistic operation. But we can assume that, uh, that you know, what China could do, for example, have a military exercise around uh, Taiwan, which lasts forever, and nobody can come in and out, and, and then, you know, test the others and see what the dynamics. 
But your, for your direct question about military assistance, uh, you know, the reality is we don't have the, we don't have the material, not the equipment in Europe. And that's actually a uh, big problem, and that's actually the discussion. So I think the most, uh, the biggest support that Europe in that situation realistically could give is, is, uh, is related to sanctions. But military assistance, no. Americans don't have, <laughs> we don't have anything, but the have, Americans yes. would like to. Th that's, a, that's a question which I want to come to you, uh, Rui, because uh, has this war uh, blurred the the separation or the lines between uh, NATO and uh, uh, and EU as far as defense policy is concerned? No, we're not yet there uh, uh, because uh, there is a difference uh, between the two mem the membership of the two organizations. Uh, in the EU, for instance, we we still have neutral countries: Ireland, mm -hmm. Austria. Just to give uh, two examples, Finland and Sweden are about to 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 leave that uh, status and uh, that is something that uh, it's important uh, uh, when we explain what we we see and what we think and we feel in Europe uh, with this uh, uh, aggressive posture of, of Russia uh, is how two countries that were neutral neutral one <laughs> during 200 years Sweden and the other one uh, almost 80 years in in a few weeks after the the invasion of uh, of Ukraine they have gave up they gave up their that uh, neutrality status which is very impressive and why is that because they feel that they they felt that uh, neutrality was not enough anymore to 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 provide security to to to, to their country so um, but but in this in that sense we still far from from that which is not a, a negative thing. I mean, uh, we have NATO, uh, which is a political military alliance, defense alliance, uh, which takes care of collective defense of, of its members. And the European Union, as Tommy was saying in the beginning, it's, 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 ma it's mainly a, a peace, uh, a peace, uh, a peace organization. I mean, defense, uh, started, uh, it's a new dimension, a relatively new dimension in the European Union. It started in the 90s and uh, very uh, baby steps and uh, now it's bolder, but, uh, but uh, still it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not the core business of the European Union. And uh, because as, as Tommy was saying, it's basically peace, prosperity, democracy are the, the, the three pillars of the European Union. And, uh, and that's very important to understand. I mean, you cannot find more peace lovers in any other region than in Europe. After two world wars in which more than 80 million people died, the European Union was created to, 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 have, to assure that we have peace in Europe. And, uh, and we have never, and it's basically an economic uh, organization and not oriented to a military. So we have for all reasons to develop uh, a stronger capacity in terms of defense at the level of the European Union and to be more autonomous, that's important. But NATO is still uh, the, the cornerstone of the European okay. defense. Right. Yes. Just before I conclude, I have two points which I want to touch on. Uh, uh, maybe you can answer that uh, on, both of you could answer that. One is, you know, the, the refugees who are coming in, the integration of the refugees, because uh, in, in there is a view that the Scandinavian countries, you know, this burning of the Quran which has taken place, it's caused a little bit of a disruption in the, um, in the polity, in the, among the people uh, with this influx of refugees. Uh, if you could both tell me a little bit about these, uh, these issues with the influx of refugees. And now you have even from Ukraine, and then there are the climate refugees who are going to come in. I think there are already some 8 million of uh, Ukrainians in uh, Europe already. So how are these, how is the refugee problem going to be resolved in the countries, culturally as well as the yeah, other? Both of you could. Valina, you could well, just... I, I can start first as a 100% immigrant who actually has been saying that for the last 20 years that I am a perfect example for a successful, at least I would like to think so, successful European integration. Mm -hmm. As someone who has was born in one country, moved uh, to study in another and you know, got the education from a second and then uh, has built, uh, you know, uh, the whole life in a third one and uh, representing this third one as an Austrian citizen, I am absolutely strongly propagating uh, that Europe, uh, given the objective 
demographic pro processes in this continent, which are pointing to a very, let's say, pessimistic future in terms of labor force, in terms of, you know, the, the population. You, know, you only need to take a look at the eastern, uh, the eastern part of Europe. Yes. It's devastating. I mean, there are countries like my home country, Bulgaria, together with Japan, these are the two countries in the world that are having the biggest issue of, you know, not just aging, but disappearing population. So migration, if handled rightly, and, you know, with the right political measures and communicated right, you know, right, right in the right manner, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that, of course, and it was already pointed out, uh, it's a continent built on peace, prosperity, stability. Once the prosperity part is starting you know, to shake, uh, we had, as, as you heard, economic crisis, financial crisis, and so on and so forth, you know, populist forces are always capitalizing on the yes. migration card, always. And because of that, the traditional you know, party forces are trying somehow to cope with this phenomenon at home because in democratic societies, every politician has to go to the elections after four years. Mm. That is the reality. So migration has been, let's say, handled probably not in the best collective way, but a lot has happened since then, a lot. I mean, since 2015, a lot has been done at the European Union level and also within the member states. And yet, of course, Again and again, and this is now again the case after pandemic and after a war, a war is always inflationary, the repercussions are huge, specifically for the small countries. Once again, we have the issue that, of course, um, the migration card is being used. Now, I'm not going to refer to the case in Sweden because I don't uh, know all the details, so I will refrain from a comment. But I will only say that you should also um, consider migration is something that nowadays, because of an interconnected world, is a phenomenon that can be also weaponized. Because, and I can give you a concrete example, uh, like the case with uh, Belarus that has facilitated migration, you know, mi migration corridor that was before the war and practically exercised pressure on uh, three concrete European Union countries. Uh, this corridor was facilitated probably with the help of other external actors, but anyway, nowadays this is also possible. You can exercise political pressure on, on states nice. by using the migration card. So you have mm. two uh, leverages. You, you have the domestic leverage, because you're exercising pressure on politicians, and then you have the you know, external pressure. So this is also reality, but given the points that you made, you know, climate change, conflicts, military, you know, conflicts, wars, the migration is something that is here to stay and it needs to be tackled in a right manner. Uh, it needs to be communicated to the people because, and I will give you a final example, uh, you know, example. Alone in Germany, in the next 15 to 20 years, there will be probably 15 million uh, people that would be retired, you know, 15 to 20 million, according to the official statistics. This is one quarter of the whole population. So the migration, you know, the migration is the only solution to this. for okay. these countries to actually uh, keep vibrant economies. Right. I'll give you the final word okay. before well, we in, in short, we are running out of time. Right. Yes. Uh, so first of all, you mentioned the climate, uh, you know, climate immigration. In fact, the current wave, which you mentioned, the numbers are, uh, are big. Basically, it's because of the war, it's war in Syria mm -hmm. and uh, war in Ukraine. Those have, cr have created uh, those, well, actually, you know, immigrate refugee mm -hmm. flows. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, but the difference, for example, to 2015 situation, which, uh, uh, as you know, we had huge flow of, uh, of, uh, of refugees coming from uh, south. The difference is this is now what we call illegal, uh, no, legal immigration. So, so, you know, those who are coming from Ukraine, they have a permission. It's going rather well in the sense, uh, you know, there's various reasons for that. First of all, because Ukrainians, it's they're mainly, you know, uh, women and children. So, you know, in the pub public mind, you have this uh, vision of, you know, we know what is happening. So basically yes. men are going to battle and uh, 
and uh, you know and uh, the mothers with the children going to live in the country it's a heartbreaking so of course the population has a different attitude ukrainians have also uh, there are many ukrainians already before who have uh, networks in uh, in europe so there's a lot of uh, you know ways of them to tackle the tackle the, the challenge so that um, so that's uh, you know one one which is helping so the political problem is at least not yet um, yet there Secondly, you know, for the future waves, I think there has been for three, four, five years a lot of question on, on border control and, uh, you know, the whole asylum process, make it faster, quicker. So I think when, you know, if refugees come or, or flows of people to Europe, I think it, it will be tackled. But you pointed right, the, the issue, as, as it was mentioned already before, we have the aging, big aging problem in, in Europe, which you don't have here in India, but we do. But, but for even knowing that, somehow we don't manage the immigration part. There is no really good case in, in, in Europe uh, where, where this Im inter sorry, integration of the immigrants to the country itself is going very, very well. Sweden was considered one of the moral countries for yes. years. But actually, what happened... It with, fell apart. Yeah, basically, many issues were not discussed. Yes. And, and left, uh, you know, things got accumulated. But uh, that will be the you know, challenge. And actually, you know, there's a commission, uh, heads of uh, European Commission and new leaders coming to India also to now to, uh, to market um, yes. uh, Europe as a place to, to work because the need is there. We need that. Uh, so we Expertise, need people to come yeah. to Europe, but we don't have the mechanism. Seem to have, we haven't found the silver bullet how to make this integration work. And that is the challenge. Right. So like I was saying about this uh, integration, I'll give you the final word, Rui, that uh, what are the what is the what is hold, what holds European Union together? Geographical, cultural ties, what what is the that thing that holds it together. Final point. Uh, well, all of that. I mean, all of uh, it. All of it. Yes. Uh, geography, culture, of course, uh, values. Values. Uh, that is, of course, and the and the shared objectives, as uh, as we were all mentioning. Just a quick word, if I still have yes, time. Yes. Sure. On um, on the, on the perceptions. I mean, perceptions sometimes are uh, more important than everything else in international relations. But we should not be led by perceptions only. This is a um, uh, this this crisis of uh, around the Ukraine of the war with, in Ukraine. It's a, it's a very serious one, and we need to talk to each other. I mean, and prevent any cleavage between the West and the rest, or the North and the South. We need to to talk to listen. We in Portugal, we are in the far west coast of Europe, mm -hmm. and by history, geography, geopolitical condition, we are used to to talk to everyone and, and to bridge sometimes. And we think it's very important to listen to the others, to their uh, concerns with this crisis, but also to explain from, from, from our perspective in Europe what is going on. And this mm -hmm. is a serious issue. And it's important to talk. Uh, and this has in a dialogue. I think it's very the important, dialogues important that we listen yes. to each other and can understand better the different points of view. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Valina. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for watching or listening into this podcast. Do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this. Namaste, Jai Hind.